right, thank you very much, Anthony, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to welcome you all to this, this uh, I can modestly say, splendid exhibition, because all that Anthony and I have done is um, go through the remarkable collection that A.H. Reid very kindly left this city um, to, uh, to, to treasure, a collection of over 800 items to do with Samuel Johnson, and uh, we've been looking through that collection and coming up with some some things that we knew were there and other things that were interesting and surprising and have got a selection of 50 of those uh, here on display and we hope that you'll take the opportunity tonight or sometime in the next couple of months to, to have a good look around and uh, get a little bit of a, a taste for the, uh, just the tip of the iceberg of what's, what's represented in this collection. The collection will tell you far more about Samuel Johnson than I have the opportunity of, of telling you tonight in, in the few minutes that I've got to distract you from the wine and nibbles. Um, have a look around the collection, read the catalogue. Um, I won't tell you Johnson's life story because we can, there's far more pleasurable ways of, of finding out about that. But what I thought I would reflect upon is what it is that keeps uh, Samuel Johnson before our gaze 300 years um, after he was born and uh, 200 and, I thought we'd better work this out, 215, 225 years after he died, uh, why is he still alive issue? Now, of course, in academic circles, you know, we keep all sorts of things alive just for the sake of sustaining our careers. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and there's a whole lot of dead writers who are, who are kept alive on that, that kind of basis. But Johnson is kept alive on a very different kind of a basis to that, and I think that that's one of the things that makes him, makes him most fascinating, that there, there are not just um, scholars who are studying his work, as indeed scholars will study anything, but there are people outside of the academy in societies, uh, societies of amateurs, uh, people who simply love Johnson and love reading about him. There are museums, there are journals and magazines, there are newsletters and conferences, uh, there are novelty items, some of which we've tried to represent in this exhibition to give us sort of a taste of of the sort of non-bookish side of the interest in of the interest in Johnson, a very wide kind of um, of popular uh, understanding, which keeps Johnson's reputation ticking over from generation to generation. People are probably less surprised <coughs> now than they might once have been to find that Johnson is the study is the the subject of a, the abiding interest of a great many people around the world. After all, people are interested in all sorts of things, from growing carnivorous plants to collecting Star Wars figures. And people seem now more than ever to be very much defined by the things that they're interested in. Um, and they can locate their interests and make contact with other people who share their interests uh, through the internet, which is a, uh, a remarkable resource for cultivating people's obsessions. So why should we be surprised that there are people who are, are obsessed by Samuel Johnson uh, when there's so many other more curious things around? I think Johnson himself would have been transfixed by the internet. He was very interested in means of intellectual exchange and how, how ideas move from place to place. Uh, he was very curious uh, about, the, about the transfer of knowledge and anxious that knowledge be transferred in the best ways possible. And he was very accepting of anything that would make knowledge available, available on a more agreeable kind of a basis. He said that the best, someone asked him, what are the best kinds of books? And he said, well, the best kind of a book is a book that you can hold in your lap, that, that you don't have to sit at a table in order to read, something that you can carry around in your pocket. That's the best kind of book because it makes what's in it available for immediate use. And I think that this is what we find uh, about Johnson, that his, his work, although you'll find it in here sometimes uh, incarnate in quite huge volumes, there's something about his work that is very immediately available for, for people appropriating for their own purposes. And this is why I, I think that there's this sense of a strong connection that people make uh, with Johnson when they start reading him. One of his own frequently reiterated opinions was that curiosity is one of the permanent and certain characteristics of a vigorous intellect. And he reiterates that in, in other places. He says, in great and generous minds, curiosity is the first passion and the last. And I think that's very true. Although he, he might have felt that uh, 
that curiosity is gratified rather too cheaply and irresponsibly by devices such as the internet, when you actually have to sort of actually work hard in order to gratify your curiosity, perhaps there's, uh, there's perhaps some more, some more benefit in it than the possibility of, of gaining information that goes uh, through your head without lodging in there uh, mm -hmm. if you don't have to put in too much effort in order to get it. And John, Johnson wasn't, uh, despite his reputation as, as a moralist and a moral writer for whom moral concerns are always first and foremost, and I don't think there's any arguing with that, despite that reputation, Johnson is not a judgmental writer, and he's certainly not judgmental about the sorts of things that people choose to fill up their minds with. Um, as I said, whether it be carnivorous plants or Star Wars figures, Hester Thrale once complained to him of a young male relative of hers uh, who was squandering his time on, on gambling and girls. Um, <laughs> and have times changed at all? And, uh, and Johnson said, when, when she was sort of complaining about this, this is you know, a waste of his life, he said, why life must be filled up, and the man who is not capable of intellectual pleasures must content himself with such pleasures as his, as the, his senses can afford. <laughs> so if that's all he's got to fill up his life with, well, let him fill up his life with it. You've got to fill up your life with something. Even on the topic of smoking, and I think there's only one remark about smoking that I've ever found in all of Johnson's writings or conversations. He said, um, perhaps rather oddly, smoking has gone out. Well, <laughs> that was in the middle of the 18th century uh, that, uh, that he thought that smoking had gone out, but nevertheless it seemed to have come back in again, and he said, to be sure, it is a shocking thing blowing smoke out of our mouths and into other people's mouths, eyes and noses, and having the same thing done to us. Yes, I cannot account why a thing which requires so little exertion and yet preserves the mind from total vacuity. <laughs> I remember years and years ago before I'd made the acquaintance of Samuel Johnson, I, I was going out briefly with a girl who was a smoker and we were in a restaurant back in the days when you were allowed to smoke in restaurants and I said to her, I can see why you smoke because we're you go to the loo, I just sort of sit here and do nothing. And when I go to the loo, you have a smoke. It just, it's an alternative to doing nothing, which is exactly Johnson's observation. Preserves the mind from total vacuity. Um, and Johnson is prepared to say, well, th this, is, this is the human condition. Our minds must be filled up with stuff. And it's, it's those sorts of remarks and those sorts of thoughts, which I've tried just for a, a moment or two to give you some sort of pleasure in processing that thought, which is the sort of thing that you'll find in every page of Johnson's writings and conversations. And that to some extent explains why he continues to be read, to be memorised, to be quoted and to be loved. He puts one, one might say, um, not so much in the way of certain particular opinions, and there are plenty enough of those that could be memorised and recycled and brought up at, at opportune occasions, but he puts one more into a way of thinking, which is always new and always true. A, a direction of thought that one can, I think, intellectually be of the school of Johnson by taking uh, the sort of down-to-earth and, and common-sense kind of approach that he takes to getting to the nub of issues. We do have the sense, perhaps, that to engage with um, a powerful intellect, we have to deal with esoteric subjects, that the only way in which you can rise to, to intellectual heights is by thinking about things of immense complexity, such as quantum mechanics or, or neuroscience or the works of Samuel Beckett. Um, but um, Samuel Johnson's interests are not esoteric. He has something to say, something interesting, something new, something important about every topic imaginable. And it might be said, perhaps, that the pleasure of engaging with Johnson is that of engaging with a powerful mind that deals not with dark and remote abstractions, but with ordinary human experience. He makes wisdom approachable.